Okay, well, thank you. Welcome to everyone who's joining us now live on YouTube as well. Um, apologies for us not being able to be connected earlier. We will certainly upload everything that you have missed. We, have, we heard some very powerful presentations this morning. But without further ado, we will carry on with the panel and we have to finish dot at one o'clock because our esteemed speaker, Dr. Hayao Mahavan, has to fly to Oslo to participate in the Nobel ceremony tomorrow. We are happy that the Nobel Peace Prize is coming home again to Iran, to an Iranian woman activist, uh, Nargis Mohammadi. And um, so we have to finish dot at 1 p.m. London time to allow him to be there. Now, we have uh, the Right Honourable Bijanik Kian. We are very honoured to have you with us, sir. Thank you for staying up at this unearthly hour in California. Um, Bijanik Kian is twice confirmed by the Senate of the United States. Um, he's a former senior official of the United States government. He served as deputy lead for the Office of Director of National Intelligence in President Trump's presidential transition team in 2016 to 17. His public statements and publications reflect his own personal opinion. He's here talking to us um, on a very interesting um, testimony that he's been in interrogation. He will tell us more about it, and then uh, hopefully we can investigate it more in the question and answers. Um, so, Bijan John, thank you very much for bearing with us with all our technical problems. We're very grateful that we see you smiling back at us and not angry with us. And um, we look forward to hearing your presentation. You have 10 minutes, sir. Well, Roy and John, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. But I also like to thank the organizers, the Association of Iranian Researchers, and your distinguished speakers for sharing their thoughts uh, this morning. Uh, yes, it's my pleasure to join you uh, 4 o'clock in the morning in California. Good morning, London. Uh, I'd like to uh, add to the introduction that you so kindly provided for me to say that I'm a volunteer at the Institute for Voices of Liberty. Institute for Voices of Liberty has a political identity which follows the will of what we call freedom-seeking people of Iran those who renounce and reject the entirety of the institution of Islamic Republic and its constitution and its related institutions, those who believe in preservation of territorial integrity and cultural diversity of Iran, and those who believe in a government by the people for the people based on four principles of consent, participation, equality, not of income or assets, but equality of opportunities, and most importantly, freedom to choose. Meaning, if they said yes yesterday to anything, they should be able to say no any day, according to the law. So with that introduction, uh, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, previous speakers talked about militarization of two regions of Iran. See, so Stan and Baluchistan and Kurdistan. Today, uh, I'm not going to spend the time uh, reciting plenty of evidence on why there is such a level of poverty in the region of Sistan and Baluchistan. Uh, instead, uh, I'm going to focus on why. Why is this government, the past 44 years, has been continuously militarizing this region, uh, and I would like to do this in describing it in three uh, scenes. Uh, by the way, th this is not uh, a fairy tale, it's not stories made up by people who are fed up with the tyranny of Islamic Republic. What I'm about to share with you is a personal testimony of an eyewitness from inside Iran, very close to the system. Very soon, uh, this confidential source will come and join you and others to tell the story that I'm about to tell you. Scene one starts from the end of the Iran-Iraq war. Asim Soleimani was not the sharpest knife in the kitchen in the war. There were others who had more military victories, who had more in their resumes to to boast about, Asim Soleimani was not one of them. He was from Kerman. He was sent back to Kerman to lead 
the IRGC unit there. Well, the neighboring province of Sistan and Baluchistan uh, needed also a representative in IRGC, and the government does not trust people who were in the IRGC from Sistan and Baluchistan to be in command of the forces in that region. They asked Qasim Soleimani to go there and take over that region. Soon after that, Qasim Soleimani found out. It was so obvious he didn't have to find out. It was right there for him to see that 40% of all the opium, probably in the region, probably in the world, enters through the border with Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq and exits through the Kurdistan region in the West. He was not a businessman. He didn't know he was trained in perhaps leading young people to their deaths. Carelessly, he had no military training. He had no, no education in military tactic or strategy. And even worse than that, he had no idea about the economics of anything. So at this time, uh, he is now aided by another so-called general from the IRGC. I mean, these people, as you all may know, became generals uh, with one stars and two stars at age 19. And this other 19-year-old uh, general uh, was none other than a person who sits today as the Speaker of the Parliament, Mohammad Bagher Bagibov. Uh, apparently, he had a sense for business, and he was sent by those who made the decisions in and around uh, decision makers at the time to aid Asim Soleimani in turning a crisis into an opportunity. The crisis uh, was the uncontrollable opium trade. And the controls that they wished to put in place was to somehow benefit from this. So Alibov joins Asim Soleimani and uh, together uh, they go to Mr. Khamenei, the so-called supreme leader of the Islamic Republic. And they present the case to him. And that case is the following. That, you know, we are about to fund uh, Woods Force. Woods Force is the external arm of IRGC with a charter and a mission to blow things up and kill people. It needs a budget. The budget, we cannot take it to the parliament, present it to the deputies, and ask them to approve the budget to kill people and blow things up. We need money. So why don't we control, control the opium trade to be able to create a source of revenue? Now, we're talking about the actors in this, Asim Soleimani, Mohammed Dover Valibov, and Abinei himself, who endorsed this plan, to further convince him that this is a good idea, and perhaps he didn't need any convincing to do because he was thinking about solving the problem, funding the Woods Force. They said, this opium is going to exit through Kurdistan into Europe and make young Europeans addicted to opium, and this would be a great victory for Islam. So, this, uh, this reasoning was very, very appetizing uh, for Khamenei, and he personally approved the plan. And with that, uh, we saw the continuation of a charade later on, even endorsed by the State Department in the United States in 2001. There was a big, big fanfare about how the government of Islamic Republic is cooperating with the government of the United States in curbing the trade of opium in the region. This report is public and it's accessible by anyone who's interested to read it. It leaves the question of where did the information come from? How was it validated? Who investigated this cooperation and the results that it produced? Was it for political expediency that a report was published to show you know, that the, the uh, IRGC is cooperating with the United States government in an 
anti-narcotics mission. Uh, was, it, was there any truth to it? Well, I'm going to fast forward to just a few months ago where the daughter of Basim Soleimani discusses the personal story of how the number one smuggler in the region was a regular guest at lunches in their home. This is not a bunch of dissidents outside of Iran talking about this. It's Qasem Soleimani's daughter, Theyna, who's telling the story. You perhaps heard that story directly from her. She's describing a close relationship between the number one smuggler, a man by the name of Iduk Alberi, and Qasem Soleimani. And uh, that's, that's really telling as to what was going on. Uh, the glorious report from the State Department says that, you know, this, this cooperation was so successful that the trade was reduced and this was an amazing cooperation and success and built it as if it was a real, real uh, effort to reduce the volume of opium entering Iran. Well, evidence shows something else. What we have in front of us is not only the confession by the daughter of Qasem Soleimani that a relationship existed there, but also looking at the question of funding the goods force. Where did the money come from? That is a question that needs to be asked. The second scene that I like to describe is what happened next. What happened next was systematic corruption allowed Qasem Soleimani and Alibaba. These are just two of them. I'm sure they share the wealth with others within this, this institutionalized corruption in Iran. But they built a fortune. Part of the money from the opium trade was spent by Alibaba in his campaign for the post of the mayor of the city of Tehran. The rest was deposited in charitable foundations, today run by Zainab Soleimani, the daughter of Basim Soleimani, and the wife of Mohammed Bogat Alibov. And if you're asking yourself, where does Ms. Zainab Soleimani get millions of dollars to donate to Lebanon's Hezbollah and others? Perhaps Islamic Jihad, maybe Hamas. Where does she get the money? Did she earn it through some uh, particular skills? Or did the money come from the opium uh, from across the border? So these are the questions that need to be really looked at seriously. The point is, the government of Islamic Republic has been intentionally depriving the people of Sistan and Balochistan, four million people are being systematically deprived of economic development by the Islamic Republic. This is an issue that needs to be investigated, interrogated by all those. And I know there are distinguished individuals here whose business has been to investigate these matters and get to the truth. I believe there are very specific actions that need to be taken about this issue needs to be opened up. And all those who have participated in creating this image that there is cooperation in fighting narcotics uh, must take shared responsibility in what has happened. An old friend of mine used to say, truth fears no questions. I think it's important that the truth is investigated and is found and as for the future, I like to suggest a call for action on two fronts. Number one, fully investigating this 2001 report by the United States Department of State independently to see if there is any truth about this intentional deprivation of economic development for the people of Sistan and Balochistan. And number two, a personal experience is the basis for the next call. When we went to Afghanistan, uh, one of the, I mean, we had successes, we had failures, mostly failures, but we had a few good things that happened there. One of the best things that happened there was the 
United States Geological Survey. It's an institution that finds uh, treasures on the ground and uh, natural resources. Found that there is more than three trillion dollars of precious metals and other rare metals, rare earth uh, material uh, under the soil in Afghanistan, which could be used for development of the country. Uh, same thing needs to happen for Iran's Sistan and Baluchistan. It's important. Whether the United States Geological Survey is encouraged to do that or by law is, is allowed to do that, I'm not sure what it takes to do that, but it needs to be done. What hasn't happened in Sistan and Baluchistan must happen as soon as possible. There is a generational window that's closing. Iran has a very young population, but this population is getting old, fast. And the number of people who work, the number of people who need to be supported by the government are not in balance. Once that window is closed, it's very difficult to turn back the clock. That's not how economics for generations work. Uh, I, I'd like to finish by saying that there is injustice today in Sistan and Baluchistan. And if anyone is asking, what's in it for me? Why do I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to join distinguished speakers here at this very timely conference? It's because it's important, because we all carry that responsibility. I've said this before, I would say it again. Until injustice is corrected, we're all from Sistan, we're all from Baluchistan, we're all Kurds, we're all part of the oppressed people in Iraq, who some have been intentionally deprived of their economic development in those regions. I'm Thank very grateful. Inviting me. I'm happy to say if there are any questions I can answer uh, to the best of my ability. I'm very grateful. Thank you. For the sake of everyone here and watching us, uh, Bijan very kindly shared me the um, report that he's mentioned in his talk, the 2001 paper, and it reads like a press release for the Islamic Republic. There's no mention of the executions, there's no mention of the imprisonment for drug offenders in Iran or drug addicts. There's, it just reads as if it's a love affair between the um, US administration at the time and the Islamic Republic. It's, it's bizarre. Um, we will share it on our website since the report is in the public domain so people can read it. And um, once we get a chance to come back to question and answers, hopefully we can discuss it further. But thank you very much again for staying up and for being with us and staying with us until the end of the panel. Thank you. Um, I'm going to quickly move on to our next speaker, Nasser Bolidei, who's the chair of the Baluchistan People's Party. And he has a very important title to his talk, um, which will then bring us to um, why we have the two esteemed gentlemen on either side of me. Um, Nasser's um, paper is called Crimes Against Humanity or Inconsequential Killings. Thank you. Ten minutes. Or I may just give you a little bit more time because yeah. other people have had a couple of more minutes, but not much more. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Roy, and uh, thank the association for the arranging this meeting for us all. And, uh, I'll put this here, just groups, so that you uh, know the time. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> As you said, actually, I think uh, I was uh, thinking more about the, the title in my the presentation to the, the secret genocide. But as you know, the genocide has a very big kind of uh, consequence, and it is uh, something is uh, even the killing of the Jews by the, the Hitler was not considered a genocide at the time. It was uh, based on the, the, the people that were convicted mostly. It was because of the uh, crime against humanity or the crime against humanity. I cannot say anything about that one here, but we have seen panelists who would uh, maybe describe what does it mean, but at least it's something that even if it doesn't have any convention, but was used internationally. But what I, I see, my experience here is uh, about the Baluch situation. Where murdering Baluch is inconsequential is because uh, there is no reaction from international community. As uh, Simeon mentioned, it's not mentioned much in the Iranian media as it should be. 
just this, uh, if you, since the, the uh, Gaza war, anything that happens in the world, any kind of change in Iran, year changing, even the European year changing, international year changing, or presidential change, you can see an increase of uh, execution in Iran, but also in Balochistan. And as, as I have seen it in the, during this time that I've been active, uh, even I have been politically active, but I have been working with mostly in human rights, given that what's happening in Balochistan has been mostly to the United Nations. And I've been talking there, and I have been sitting in the panel with Ahmad Shahid and now with Javid Rahman here too, and talking about Baluch situation. And even I have said that in the United Nations, I'm sorry to say that one, uh, I said that uh, a fact finding mission to Iran too, uh, that I feel there is a social chauvinism when it's come to Baluch. It's uh, from part of the uh, international community. And as I can, I, I quoted here too from the Kissinger at the time when he was uh, not foreign minister, but he was esteemed kind of uh, uh, respected within the government in, uh, in the US and uh, at the time of the President Kennedy. When he came to Balochistan, uh, it is the same thing, Balochistan in Pakistan or Balochistan in Iran, if you say it. And when they asked him about Balochistan, what do you think what's happening in Balochistan? He said, I would not even, uh, uh, react if it slapped my face. And that's what the international community has been since then and before when it's come to Balochistan situation. And uh, I'm an opinion that uh, uh, what's happening in Balochistan is a kind of government policy. It has, was not defined by this government, Islamic Republic of Iran. It was defined uh, during the Pahlavi government. And even we can see it during the Qajar government. Mass killing of Balochistan has been part of the, the kind of armed attacks on Balochistan from the Qajar time, and it is continuing. And you can see it even sometimes in literature in Iran. That's uh, somehow acceptable to kill. And that's something that we have to deal with, because otherwise, this will continue. We know there are forces in Iran always using, as we always talk about territorial integrity of Iran, and this used to kill people. This, not, this is not used to make people that you come together. We should be one people. It's used to kill people. And when we hear, Iran territorial integrity, it means that there is a bullet coming towards me. I would be excused for anything. Just say that why I'm being killed, they say, well, you are, uh, you are uh, the separatist. If I say why my language is not respected, they say, well, then you are most likely separatist, you should be killed. And that's what being used. And that's we, when we hear this word, this word is a, a killing. It's, it's a human right situation here. So we have to, to, to emphasize on that one. Uh, when it's come to Balochistan, I mean, uh, when there's uh, Hoveda, that's why I'm saying it's, it's not something new. That's historical and it's going on. And that's why we are very much careful to see the next government is not going to continue with same policies that Pahlavi had and this regime has. So that's, uh, that's what our, one of our reasons that we, when we talk to the people, we want a kind of a positive coalition, not a negative coalition based on only saying that we overthrow the dictatorship. Okay, we overthrow the dictatorship, what will happen? then come Raza Pahlavi, and then come Khomeini. So we do not want the next time to be the same thing. We don't want mind that the name would be Raza Pahlavi or something else, but should be democratic, and it should not be something that is uh, killing people. I'm not saying that this Raza Pahlavi or that Raza Pahlavi, I'm not talking about persons, uh, but for us it's very important. Because at the time, for instance, when they ask Hoeda, why you not develop this region? He said, why we should do that? It is, uh, if uh, these people happen to live in a geopolitical situation, uh, important region, why we should, they should get benefit from that? They should be moved from here. And that was a, a long time prime minister in Iran for about almost two decades. And Khalat Bari, which is the Pahlavi, always talk about uh, Abbas uh, Khalat Bari as the, the, uh, their, I don't know, uh, 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 things like uh, uh, Jawad Zarif, he was foreign minister in Iran. And when he was asked about the Baluch, he said, well, we always think the Baluch will uh, try to gain their independence one day. So it's uh, uh, obviously we have to keep them backward, weak, disunited politically. And that has been the policy of the Pahlavi, uh, that Baluchistan should be backward. And when you see that Baluch doesn't have a school, there is no road. And we are uh, somehow not represented in media. We are not represented in bureaucracy in Iran. It has been planned from the before. It's not something that has happened in, in a vacuum. We don't like to work. No, we are trying. If you go to uh, the, the same Baluch family, part of the Baluch family that had moved to the Gulf region because of the suppression again, 
uh, there they are they are minister they are uh, head of the army they are diplomats but in iran as you said uh, simon mentioned there is uh, for instance only <laughs> one baluch khatamenar uh, we have been uh, 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 Baluchistan governor, and he was from Kerman region of Baluchistan. And one thing I have to say here, when it's come to suppressing Baluch, there has been some possibility for the Shias, but the, the part of the Baluchistan where the Shias lives is currently in Muslim Kerman, and uh, to some extent in Baluchistan. And here, uh, Mr. Eid Muhammad was mentioned, Eid Muhammad was not a big smuggler. He was a just kind of a person who fought against the regime. Uh, maybe he was involved, but he was not a big smuggler. And he was a child when his father was killed in front of him by the regime. So that's why he went to the mountain and fought against the regime. He killed some revolutionary guard. He killed some uh, uh, security forces. I'm not saying that he did a good thing. But uh, you can imagine a young man when he's in about 10, 12 years, and you can kill his father, his all the family, and then was left for him. So you have to understand the situation in Baluchistan when people like Malik Regi come and people like Aid Muhammad come. And then, of course, uh, there is misunderstanding about them, too. Uh, we are against all kinds of use of two force by the Baluch or by the governments. Uh, but I think here you have, want to have to understand that the, that the killing that's happening in Baluchistan, it has consequences sometimes in the form of those. But at least as we can see now, the Baluch struggle always have been civil resistance. It's never have been armed and it's uh, not showing particularly in Maki Mosque, as I was saying, the Mulevi Abdul Hamid is leading that one. And we are proud to say that we as a Balochistan People's Party had worked on that one to make sure that Balochistan becomes secular. When Mulevi Abdul Hamid has said about Taliban or supporting Raisi, we have been critical on those. We have been the group that only for a political group in Balochistan uh, that have said that, that's a strong. And Mulevi Abdul Hamid being a wise man, a man who knows something, he, when he have heard these things, he never have blamed us to be wrong. He have accepted this kind of thing. So he's a, he's a kind of leader that listens to the people, and that's uh, what's important. Uh, for, for me, is to say that one here, that uh, to, 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 to emphasize that one, what I see in Balochistan is a crime against humanity, and uh, according to the, the articles of the Roman statutes, and I think it's very important for the international community to recognize that one, and I think it's very important for us to uh, to be recognized, because the, this much killing in Balochistan that's happening, when you see that, uh, each uh, year we see, the, 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 and, and this has been reported by Amnesty International today, in 1991, for instance, and you can see these, these things that, for instance, in 2010, there was demonstration, 2009, in, actually demonstration then started also in Baluchistan. Many people forget that one. That demonstration before even the presidential election happened in that region. And the regime, even we have the reports, the regime at that time blamed uh, our party and uh, uh, other parties for uh, instigating those things. And they said that we have got money from the French government. I've, I've gone and met the French, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, spy service, but I never knew any French spy service. At least I've heard that CIA leader or the I don't know, <laughs> Musa's leader, but never heard anything about the French <laughs> intelligence service. But they said we have met him, we have got money to instigate those demonstrations in, in Zahedan. Actually, the demonstration happened first in Zahedan and then after the election in, in, in other part of the Iran. Uh, but Baluchistan, of course, was not involved in the, uh, saying that we, Musa, we should come, or uh, Ahmadinejad. But then again, when the demonstration started in Baluchistan, they, uh, they arrested 150. In Tehran, they arrested more. But the regime did not uh, uh, execute many in Tehran at that time. They executed 19 people in one day in Baluchistan. And there was a bomb explosion in Zahedan. Uh, they arrested, uh, uh, they didn't arrest anyone. But the, uh, on the 19th April, and on the 31st April, they killed three people, hanged them in the street in Zahedan. Uh, and then they said they have been planning, and uh, they, 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 they did this explosion. But they were, at the time, were in prison. Simply, they were, simply because they were Baluch, they were executed, and they were blamed for this explosion. But these things never have mentioned in any cases that how the regime is doing these things? Why is finding this kind of situation where you just go and find somebody in the prison and kill? And that's what we uh, have to, to mention, I think, in those reports. And I think I remember once I was uh, in, in Mr. John Vidraman, we had a, a session, and there I mentioned the, the problem sometimes is that, for instance, this uh, reports that's written by the United Nations or other institution or Amnesty International, even in, uh, once in a Siemens program in uh, Cheshmandas, I had a clash. 
uh, Sima, Sima, yeah, sorry, with Sima uh, with uh, uh, Amnesty International. And there I mentioned Amnesty International has been silenced for decades about Baluchistan. And after that one that I criticized Amnesty International, they came and wrote something, but it was the same report that 10 years ago they had done it. They only changed some board. They didn't even give it 10 minutes to change a new, to, to do new job. The same that uh, the former kind of uh, head of uh, person that are working on uh, uh, Amnesty International, because I, I, I have all those reports in my uh, computer and I printed them out too. So I know when, it, when it's come, I remember this is the same report. The same report, they, 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 it's nothing changed. It shows that they do not give in time to Baluch. And that's the problem. And we see those reports that are published by the special reporters and by other groups. We see that there is, as I said here, 75% of the execution and arrests are in, happening in Kurdistan and Baluchistan. But then in, in those reports, 90% or sometimes 95% is about Tehran or people that with privilege. Not the people like in Baluchistan. They only mention maybe in, the, in one paragraph. Actually, this time I have to thank Mr. Jawi Ram. The, the, the last one gave more space to the national minorities and to Baluch. But previously, that has been maybe mentioned in one paragraph, not more than that. But sometimes just say that many of those that have been executed as ethnic minorities. But that's not enough. And then regime sees that it's inconsequential. There is no consequence for it to kill Baluch. And that's why. He even if whenever he feels to show that it's strong, it's effective, and they use that we are effective, and then they go and find some Baluch and kill them. And beside that, there is uh, extrajudicial killings in Baluchistan. Every week, there are two, three, four, five uh, people are killed. Sometimes one day, three, four, five people are killed. And I was, uh, thank you very much. And when I just I wanted to make sure that when we say about Sistan, Baluchistan, uh, it, it is uh, what's happening in Baluchistan. It's not only in Sistan, Baluchistan. It's a part of the, in Hormozgan region, the same thing is happening. Part of the Baluchistan, which is in Kerman, the same thing is happening. Even I can say it's worse. Baluch who are living in, in those provinces who not only suffer for the, the, uh, from the, the uh, uh, countrywide separation, but they even su suffer from uh, a provincial separation too. People Baluchi living in Kerman are in worse situation than Baluchi in Baluchistan, and the same thing for the Baluchi in Hormozgan. So we have to think about that one. When we talk about Baluchistan, it's not only Sistan and Baluchistan. There are the Baluch people there also suffering at the same level. The regime does not discriminate us because we live in different provinces, even if it's uh, oppress us more on those provinces. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Very valuable um, contribution. We hear you. The reason that we are organizing the second conference on Baluchistan is because we hear you and we want to be able to carry the voice um, forward. Um, hopefully, from the two next presentations that we hear, maybe we have, we will be able to address the consequence issue. Um, we've heard. Um, many, many times about the number of um, executions, disproportionately high executions, the brutality, um, the violence against the Iranian um, Baluch people um, that have been under for, for years, but specifically in the last year, it's been evident to the world. We've, we've been watching it. Um, and we're very privileged and honored to have um, Professor Payo Mahavon with us, whose expertise is this very question of um, Assessing Crimes Against Humanity. Uh, professor Payo Mahavan is a professor of international law at Messi College, University of Toronto. And he's also a special advisor to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court at The Hague. So we couldn't have a better placed person who can hear you and then say what we can do. And also maybe Payam John, you can tell us um, if what is happening in Baluchistan, if what they are, we've heard this morning and we will carry on hearing this afternoon, does constitute something like crimes against humanity. What are the ABCs? And then what can we do? I'm sure that um, you will have many answers for us. Okay. Is this the microphone I should use? Yes. Okay. Oh. Thank you. 
جامعه و اقتصادی کشور مایی بیزنس هستیم برای اینجور رو میگون از فرقی ترش دادن مرده برای یه بیزنس دوستان عزیز صبح همگی به خیر از جناب دکتر لاجوردی و سرکار خانم دکتر کاشفی بسیار سپاس گذارم که به من افتخار شرکت در این پنل با همکاران گرامی رو دادن I will be speaking today on the 75th anniversary of the adoption on December 9, 1948 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. In fact, the first human rights instrument to be uh, adopted by the United Nations, as my distinguished colleague, Professor Rahmani, also referred to. And the following day on December 10th, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted. And it's important to think 75 years later about why these instruments emerged and what relevance they have for the struggles that we have today, such as the one uh, of the uh, violent persecution against the Baluchi people uh, in Iran. And when we think about crimes against humanity and genocide, we have to begin with the premise that the Holocaust did not begin in the gas chambers. It began with words. It began with the dehumanization and demonization of other human beings because of their identity and nothing more. And that dehumanization and demonization is what is always necessary for mass murder. It is always necessary to deny and disregard the dignity of others in order to justify treating them with such extreme violence. And I say this because some of us may think, what can we do sitting here in London for the people in Zahedan and the others who are suffering these crimes. And it's important for us to know that the beginning of the journey towards justice is the transformation of our culture, is to change the conversation that we have with each other. Turning to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I also think it's important following uh, the presentation that we have just heard to speak about the relationship between territorial integrity and human rights. Because whenever we speak about the rights of minorities, immediately there is an accusation that we are somehow promoting secession, we are promoting the disintegration of the territorial integrity of Iran, which is nothing but a cynical pretext to justify the continuation of violent repression. Human rights tell us that human dignity is universal, that every human being deserves to be treated with dignity and with respect. And in that regard, our message is simple. Iran for all Iranians. Iran baraye tamam shahvandan Iran bar asas adalat, bar asas karamat ensani. It is as simple as that. Now, crimes against humanity emerged first in the Charter of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, which was established to prosecute the Nazi leaders upon the conclusion of the Second World War. And there are two important historical lessons here. First of all, crimes against humanity was necessary because many of the crimes of the Nazis were against their own nationals. And in 1945, international law did not yet recognize universal human rights. So it was necessary to create a new category which recognized that some crimes are so shocking to the conscience of humankind that they must be prosecuted irrespective of the nationality of the victims. That is the first point. The second point, which is important, is that at the end of the Second World War, some, including uh, Prime Minister uh, Winston Churchill, uh, Chairman Joseph Stalin, argued that the Nazis should simply be lined up and executed upon the capture of Berlin, whereas it was the Americans who insisted that there must be justice, there must be a process of denazification, The German people must understand the truth and the reality of the crimes that have been committed if there is any chance for a post-war democratic transformation of Germany. Both of those lessons are essential when we look at the question of 
crimes against humanity, and most important, the question of accountability for those crimes. Crimes against humanity, in simple terms, is defined in Article 7 of the Statute of the International Criminal Court as a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population through means such as murder, torture, rape, and other forms of sexual violence, deportation, but also persecution on religious, ethnic, and other grounds, which includes the discriminatory denial of fundamental human rights. That, in short, is the description of crimes against humanity, and it doesn't take much imagination to understand that what the Islamic Republic has been doing for the past 45 years as a matter of state policy, as a matter of state policy, is to incite hatred and violence against all manner of uh, ethnic, religious, and other minorities. But the real question is not whether these atrocities qualify as crimes against humanity or not. The question is how are we going to achieve justice, given the fact that the judicial system of Iran, rather than dispensing justice, itself is an instrument of injustice and repression. One can hardly turn to the revolutionary courts, which have been responsible for mass executions from the very early days of the revolution in order to arrive at justice. Well, we have the International Criminal Court in The Hague. The problem is that Iran, predictably, is not a party to that statute, because why would it recognize the jurisdiction of a court that would turn around and prosecute its entire leadership? The only option is for the United Nations Security Council to refer the situation uh, to the International Criminal Court, acting under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. Once again, we look at the reality of global politics uh, and its cynicism, where uh, human rights and justice are always subordinated to geopolitical calculations. The exercise of the veto power by the Russian Federation, by China, and what have you, which makes that option also difficult to achieve. We do, however, have now, after many years of struggle, the United Nations fact-finding mission for Iran, which is documenting these crimes, including the violent persecution against the people of Baluchistan. And at the very least, we must document these crimes. We must establish the historical truth, because at George, as George Santayana famously said, what we forget, we are condemned to repeat again. At the very least, the people of Iran must know what is happening to our brothers and sisters in Baluchistan. But beyond that, I think we need to start thinking about what transitional justice will look like in Iran. And my faith is less with the International Criminal Court, where I have the privilege of being a special advisor to the prosecutor, and it is more with the courts of a future democratic Iran. Why can we not start thinking about what a democratic transition would look and how perhaps a special court for Iran established specifically for the prosecution of the top leadership for their individual criminal responsibility for crimes against humanity could be an essential ingredient, not simply in a shifting of power from one group of tyrants to another, but a genuine transformation which will finally allow the people of Iran to achieve freedom based on equality. I will stop there and thank you once again for uh, having invited me. And perhaps since in Iran we love poetry, I will share the famous poem of Rumi who says that there is love in every religion, but love has no religion. And that basic empathy, that basic sense of compassion, feeling the suffering of others, is the beginning and end of our journey out of this catastrophe to a better future. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've answered some, of, some very important questions there. Um, and all within your 10 minutes, you still had a minute left, so we'll give you a prize. Thank you. <laughs> um, we have had um, 
thinking about transitional justice in the future of Iran, um, it's good to just remember that we had Iran Tribunal and we had the Arban Tribunal, which were people's court um, thinking about um, the future and all of that. And um, the judges and the international panel that sat at both Iran Tribunal and Arban Tribunal, looking at the events that happened during the massacres of the summer of during the 1980s and also what happened in November 2019 in Iran. Um, both panels at the end, both judges, um, people who sat in decision making, uh, it was a people's tribunal, um, both said crimes against humanity and it's been documented and I'm happy uh, to say that our, uh, the Baluch civil society are also documenting all of this and we're doing all that we can. And as you say, it's so important to remember this and to document it now for future and to have this on, on record that people have heard. It's really important to share um, the stories as we heard with Fariba because that keeps it alive. It's very real then. It's not just statistics. We keep hearing about so many numbers of executions and um, extrajudicial killings, but when you hear these very personal stories, um, it makes it very real, and um, it's it's shared pain with all Iranians. It's not just a question of it being the Iranian Baluch people. The laws and the practice of law in Iran is such that every single Iranian is persecuted to some level if they don't belong to that particular clique. Um, Dr. Rahman, we turn to you. Um, you've heard some criticism of the United Nations. Yeah, I know you're I, not responsible yeah. <laughs> for what happens everywhere else. We're all grateful for your time and efforts on, on part of Iran. Um, the previous conference that we were, had the privilege of hearing you um, in October in Florence on right to life and death penalty, um, we also um, mentioned, you mentioned uh, crimes against humanity and based on what's been happening in Iran. Um, so it's very good to have more your thoughts, um, specifically now on Baluchistan. We touched a little bit on what happened in Baluchistan in that context um, a month or so ago, but to concentrate on it, I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you. Can and I can I follow of course, uh, my good yes, friend, please do, uh, Professor Bam, and, yes. and take the. Take uh, the they'll put the yeah. mic on you oh, there. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for, for this generous invitation. I'll just begin by uh, two points. One is that um, I am the UN Special Rapporteur on the human rights situation in the Islamic Republic of Iran. I'm an independent expert, so I am not employed by the United Nations, but that gives me um, an advantage that I can have an independent voice. I can be critical. I can say what I believe is the situation and not necessarily follow uh, you know, a particular organizational view. So I think that's, that's a positive sign. And I'd be happy to address any issues uh, that pertain to, to my mandate and not specifically to the UN as such. The second point, which um, many of you may know or may not know, that I come from Pakistan. And uh, we also have a lot of issues uh, regarding uh, ethnic and religious minorities. In particular, the Baloch issue has been very central to the various political uh, and, and, and diplomatic and legal uh, issues that have arisen since the, the creation of Pakistan. And it's a, it's a traumatic history that we've had in terms of what has happened to Pakistan. But I would say that um, the, the issue of Balochistan is very close to my heart, also because I come from Pakistan. So with, with th these two points, I, I want to focus uh, particularly and, and perhaps to redress some of the, you know, some of the criticism um, made earlier on the issue of uh, Balochistan and human rights uh, and how we perceive uh, the subject uh, going forward. So. To begin with, um, the Baloch people have been both historically as well as in contemporary times discriminated, persecuted, and targeted by the Iranian authorities. And um, as many of you are aware that their most fundamental rights have completely violated with impunity. These violations have been evident for decades 
the repression, persecution, and rampant discrimination remains a systemic and systematic state policy. Tragically, the Baloch people are also targets of uh, what we all know, uh, arbitrary deprivation of the right to life at the hands of state and security agencies. In my report to the United Nations Human Rights Council in March of this year, I had highlighted the reported serious and substantial uh, crimes in international law, including crimes against humanity having taken place in Iran. And just to remind you what I said, uh, I read out uh, a paragraph. I said that severe violations of the rights to life, liberty, and security of person, the right not to be subjected to torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, the right not to be subjected to rape and other forms of sexual violence, and the right not to be subjected to arbitrary arrest or detention, have been documented since the start of the protests as part of an apparent policy instigated at the highest level of the state to crush the protests at all costs. And I, and I go on to say that the scale and gravity of these violations point to the possible commission of international crimes, notably the crimes against humanity, of murder, imprisonment, and forced disappearances, torture, rape, and sexual violence and persecution. So these were my observations to the Human Rights Council. And when I made this statement, this statement was in the context of, uh, obviously, the Women Life Freedom Movement. But it was also in the context of, um, of the targeting of ethnic, linguistic, and religious minorities. And in making this statement, I was also referring to the crimes against humanity that were specifically reported to have been committed against the Baloch people. And in my report, I have made several references to the targeting of the Baloch people. And uh, since the start of this movement, there have been many inst instances, many examples of the systemic and systematic state killings which targeted uh, the Balochis. And uh, the most horrific one, which I also referred in my report, uh, is about the brutality and torture that was unleashed on the 30th of September uh, 2022, which was also the deadliest of incidents on recorded um, you know, recorded uh, documentation since the start of the protest last year. Um, I, I don't want to go into too much detail. I think you're, you're aware of what happened on, on the 30th of September. Safe to say that the Balochis were simply demonstrating on that day peacefully to express solidarity with the protests and to demand accountability for the reported rape of a 15-year-old girl by the police commander in the province. As people gathered outside the police station across the road to protest, security forces fired live ammunition, metal pallets, and tear gas at protests and bystanders, protesters and bystanders from the police station and rooftops of nearby houses. A majority of the victims were shot deliberately in the head, heart, neck, and torso, demonstrating a clear intention kill or to seriously harm um, peaceful protesters or individuals. According to a very conservative estimate, and uh, the numbers have changed since then, uh, we reported that at least 93 people were killed on that day. Tragically, the Balochis have continued to be the victims of these crimes, including, as I say, crimes against humanity. Uh, the levels of killings, torture, and brutality against the Balochis is truly shocking. I have also noted in my last report to the Human Rights Council that more than half of the total number of persons killed since the start of the, the protests, that is the Women Life Freedom Movement, are from the Baloch and Kurdish populated provinces. Children from, the, from, from Iran's Baloch and Kurdish minorities constituted at least 63% of the recorded victims. I reported to the Council that as of December last year, at least 130 Balochis had been killed by Iranian security forces. And now I have rec I'm receiving reports that 
in the first nine months of uh, 2023, that is this year, at least 90 persons have been murdered uh, extrajudicially by the Iranian security forces, including at least uh, 22 uh, fuel carriers. The Balochis are dis disproportionately targeted and executed within the Iranian criminal justice system, with this exercise and disproportionate application evident in their convictions primarily on drug-related or security-related offences. In my report to the Council earlier this year, uh, I noted that at least 147 Balochis, while representing only 2-6% to of the total Iranian population, were reportedly executed, representing at least 30% of all executions, and more than half were executed on drug-related charges. It is reported that in 2023, by the end of September, that is in the first nine months of 2023, already at least 118 Balochis have been executed. The numbers, um, I have no doubt, would be much higher because uh, the state does not give us any accurate numbers and it's difficult to have uh, precise numbers. In addition, as I've observed, to, observed and already reported throughout my mandate, the Baloch people's right to life and fundamental human rights and well-being are, are consistently and totally undermined uh, systematically because they are left in poverty, they are rendered vulnerable to man-made or environmental calamities, and politically and economically and socially they are so disempowered that they do not have a voice. And this is all in addition to being subjugated, subjugated to state oppression, violence, and targeting. Just a few brief comments, if I may say, on the broader and the, and the disturbing picture uh, on Sistan and Balochistan province. Now, this province has already been referred to many times, remains one of the most improvised, improvised provinces in the country. The vast majority of the population lives in uh, below the national poverty line, it is also the case that the Balochis, mostly as Sunni Muslims, face intersectional discrimination and persecution, both as ethnic minorities as well as Sunni Muslims. In one of my first missions that I completed as a special rapporteur, I think that was in, in 2019, I heard first-hand accounts describing the basic infrastructure within Sistan and Balochistan province as minimal, with even no running water. There was no, there was no facilities at all that were available to the people of, of the province. I also received information that in the absence of educational facilities throughout the region, many of the inhabitants needed to travel to Zahidan, the provincial cap capital, for post-primary education and hospital care. A lack of official documentation or proof of citizenship has affected the right to education quite substantially for the predominantly Baloch Sunni population of this province. According to information that I received, this lack of documentation appears to be rooted in a lack of historical interaction with state institutions. And even by the official governmental admissions, thousands of children in the province continue to lack identification and therefore are deprived of their fundamental human right to education. So I will end by reiterating my message that the Baloch people, the Balochis, deserve better. Together with the civil society, human rights defenders, journalists, environmental activists, the international community must dedicate all its energies in pr protecting and, importantly, promoting the rights of the Balochi people. I thank you. I thought everybody knows you, and I got so excited um, and mindful of time. I am very mindful of time. We've only got 15 minutes. Um, just to sum up what, what we've heard this morning, um, we've heard a lot about how the Iranian Baluch people are underrepresented um, in news reporting or in general attention of 
um, reporting on human rights situation in Iran by other groups, by Iranians. We all also heard about that it's a shared pain as an Iranian that we have, but the Baluchis in particular are more persecuted than the rest, if such a thing is possible. Um, just a few statistics, 67% um, of the Baluch population is below the age of 30. This is according to the latest statistics published by um, Iran itself. They've also carried out a multi-dimensional um, poverty index um, survey in Iran. And again, Baluchistan, instead of being at the bottom of everything, is top of this multi-dimensional um, poverty index. It is top for not having enough hospitals, top in not having enough schools, top in not having any kind of equitable access to things that you would expect a dignified human being to have. Um, so the Islamic Republic is aware, according to its own surveys, its own calculations, its own reporting, it is aware. And you hear a lot about um, projects that they have of the region, that they are um, demonstrations rather than actual um, projects. They come, they fill themselves um, starting something, and then when the cameras go away, that's the end of the project, and the money's pocketed by a few. Um, it's very difficult to sum up the pain and the suffering of um, a group of people who share the same land borders and who, as you said, um, in the name of maintaining territorial integrity, are then persecuted and killed. Um, Sima John, I'm going to come to you and say in the 10 minutes that we have, are there any questions that you want to ask the panel before I go to the audience? Do Is there I anything? Mean, no, I'm happy to give this to you. Are, are there any questions from anyone here in the audience? Any questions? No. Do you have any questions? Uh, Negin. Yes, Negin John, please go ahead. Thank you so much for the time you spent and uh, yeah, fantastic talks you did. Um, I, it's just for, for everyone on the panel, uh, so it seems like, especially Kayo, maybe it's for you, um, it seems like it's quite difficult to take legal actions on um, crime against humanity in Manchester. Um, is there other avenues that as activists and you know, supporters of uh, the cause in Manchester um, can take to support the community and creating a legal framework in international law to, to help the community and, and take this better? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, maybe I will uh, repeat one thing I've said and add something to it, which is uh, documentation is extremely important. Having credible, typically contemporaneous documentation, witness testimony, uh, the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, which we founded about 20 years ago, has done this work. There are a number of other NGOs. And I would say to our, you know, Baluch brothers and sisters, who I know are active in this field, that getting this documentation through networks of credible, reliable uh, sources of information, and then transmitting it to the right people, whether it's other Iranian human rights organizations, the UN Special Rapporteur, the UN Fact-Finding Mission also, which is very uh, important because they will prepare a report which will be uh, tabled to the uh, Human Rights Council. Uh, beyond that, I think publicizing the evidence is also very important. We, it goes back to the Iran Tribunal, which we established 10 years ago, uh, and the broadcasting of the testimony of about 100 witnesses brought to life the reality of what had happened in 1988 in the mass executions, uh, about which most people in Iran had no idea. For them, this was a glorious decade of the revolution, and then all of a sudden, uh, uh, Madar Esmat from Sweden comes with a photograph of her four children who were executed and, and goes back to the power of empathy. I could say something as a professor, but Mother Esmat's voice probably awakened thousands more people to the reality of these horrors than anything which I could have said. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, diffusing that awareness of the historical truth is very important in creating a democratic momentum and culture. But I want to turn to maybe a couple of other quick points. 
the Hamid Nouri trial in Sweden probably would not have happened without the Iran tribunal, without people becoming aware of what transpired and even being given some incentive to provide information. And some of you may know who actually exposed Hamid Nouri and lured him to Sweden. I won't get into that, except that he's, uh, we jokingly say he's still waiting for two beautiful Swedish women <laughs> at the airport who were, uh, uh, were going to take him on a cruise in the Baltics. That's what he thought would be greeting him when he arrived in Stockholm, instead of handcuffs and, and prosecution. But universal jurisdiction prosecutions are very important, but for that you need documentation. You need to identify individuals who are responsible for the killings in Zahedan, not just as a loose accusation, but credible evidence that a prosecutor in Canada, Sweden, the UK could use if we are alerted to the presence of an individual on this territory. And I would end by saying that the momentum of the Iranian diaspora in forcing a change in policies is very important. Just recently, Canada began the first of many deportation proceedings against officials of the Islamic Republic. In this case, the deputy interior minister during the massacres of Aban, who's living happily in Canada, but who's now facing deportation. And the government has a list of many, many others. And we know Canada is one of the favorite locations for them to launder their dirty money and to live uh, happily without any consequence. So another reason why documentation is important is even if you can't have a prosecution, you can ensure that people are deported rather than being welcomed with open arms. Thank you. Yes, of course. We have, you want to add to this? Just uh, to you know, Vision Kian's uh, input on Iran. On a just, drug two minutes, channel. just two minutes, just one because minute, I have a question for Dr. Ahmad. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know if uh, Mr. Kian is still uh, online, I hope. Uh, no, I just sure wanted to uh, comment if uh, he can hopefully respond back to it. Um, uh, he talked, thank you, he talked about the channel of drug transportation and trade from Baluchistan from east to Kurdistan in west. Um, uh, I have a doubt on that because uh, why a regime has the control of entire uh, 1.6 million square kilometer of the country for almost four decades and more? Why they need that channel? Why they have every corner of Iran as a um, as a proper channel of uh, drug and military and money laundering and all of the business development they, they have. While uh, Kurdistan is harder for them than the Shiite uh, southern border in uh, Basra region or even the Persian Gulf, easily they can access all the way to Syrian border. Um, I, uh, I, I wish you could explain how this uh, information Hopefully we can have the dialogue with him afterwards. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, we've lost him. Um, I just have a quick question for you, Dr. Ahmad, more like a guidance, um, since we have you here and we have human rights activists, Baluchi human rights activists here. In presenting to you, what kind of credible documentation would um, enable you to then question or include in your reports? What sort of information? How would you like it to be verified? I mean, I know um, it's very difficult to get any information out of Iran and human rights activists work really hard to find out the names of people who've been executed or who've disappeared or who've been victims of torture. Um, what sort of evidence can be presented to you and how can it be presented to you? First of all, to enable this documentation that is so important that Dr. Ahaban also mentioned, but from your perspective, as someone who then does the reporting and then carries on, um, as an independent expert, what would enable you to carry that voice forward? Yeah, thank you. Um, you see, uh, that's an important question. And um, ever since I joined this mandate in 2018, one of the key questions I had was about Balochistan because I hardly was receiving any information of what is going on in 
uh, in Iranian Balochistan. I'm well aware of the situation in Pakistan. We have very serious issues. And I was always asking my contacts, can I can I get in touch with um, with a civil society uh, based in Balochistan or working elsewhere where they could give me verified information? And it has been a, a big struggle, you see. And that partly would explain, if you look at my reports or reports of my predecessors, that we haven't been able to do justice to Balochistan, to the issues of Balochistan. So... Um, I reached out to many organizations and they were they were consistently saying to me that, look, it is very difficult, people in Balochistan, there are issues about um, communication, education, transmission, uh, access to, to individuals. So all of them have been a difficulty. Now, in terms of the, you know, the information that we want, we want all forms of information. You know, uh, we I want to talk to individuals who are victims, who are... Uh, who are survivors, you know, I want to talk to um, to civil society activists. I, I, I must say that there, there, there isn't that, um, you know, that wealth of information, if I can call it, coming from Balochistan. So that is one avenue. Uh, other information is obviously very important, such as documentary evidence or, or video evidence or real evidence, as we call it, of what is going on. Uh, we can also um, issue uh, press releases and communications. I, 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 I dare say that we haven't had many communications focused on Balochistan. And for that, we need individuals. So, for example, when victims say that this has happened to us and they actually consent to having their name mentioned or explicitly complaining to the government, you see. So that is one big, big issue that... You know, when when there are victims, they are rather reluctant to to approach us to say, okay, can we make an official complaint? The other, uh, I think, uh, significant issue is that Balochistan has a lot of pervasive issues, like, for example, developmental concerns, you know, economic concerns. Uh, there are environmental concerns, and I would like a more uh, more of a focus from the civil society on these issues, you know. Because how can we address the issue of, let's say, environmental catastrophe that's taking place in Balochistan when we, we are not getting the, the requisite information? What needs to be done? Similarly, on the issue of, uh, you know, this um, uh, denial of right to education, what, what needs to be done? I mean, we need activism. You see, we, we need people on the ground. And I still, I often struggle to reach out to people who are based in Balochistan and the reason why I was able to report um, to the Human Rights Council earlier this year was that the media got quite heavily involved. And actually, the movement was so strong that the international community could not but focus on Balochistan. It was one of the uh, most severest forms of repression. And therefore, we had a lot of information coming from, for example, the Western media, which we could then... Uh, you know, um, which we could then relay in terms of um, uh, our own reporting. So I think there needs to be a lot more uh, interest from the civil society, relevant stakeholders, from from uh, journalists, human rights defenders on such a crucial uh, province and on such a grave situation that exists in Balochistan right now. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So basically, you're after documented evidence, verified in a sense yeah. that it's two different sources that tell the same story, the same account, and then you'll be able to yeah, yeah. Put, put the information together. Yeah, because every time we, we reach out for, uh, you know, for information, and uh, some, uh, in some cases that we get a lot of information, you see some civil society or relevant stakeholders are very active, some, you know, some um, organizations are very active who are involved in Iran. But Balochistan is still quite, uh, you know, at the back end of that kind of information. So we want more activism, basically. And I can see that there are real issues because, you know, deliberately the province has been left neglected. There Maybe there are uh, civil society not so active. I think there might be uh, linguistic hurdles, cultural hurdles. But we want to know more. I mean, 
um, I, I don't know how it, uh, how you can assist us in that. Well, it's sort of a security issue as well. Yeah, People that, are very afraid yeah, yeah. of uh, showing their face or sharing their yeah, names. Yeah. We were, um, Fariba, who's, who will be speaking in the afternoon panel, and her um, husband have been documenting um, information from Iran. And we wanted to show some of those testimonies today. Mm-hmm. But there was such fear of mm. them then being recorded and then staying yeah. sort of available for anyone to see yeah. that we decided, well, we don't want to endanger their lives mm. further than what's happened. So the security yeah. issue yeah. is uh, something. So we've decided yeah. not to share the testimonies, yeah. but yeah. we will collate and provide you with the information. Uh, definitely. And if I can just add that, uh, you see, I have received some documentary evidence, some videos, but I know that a lot more atrocities have taken place, particularly since last year, September. So we really need more evidence, you know, um, victims' testimonies, but also, uh, you know, when what happened to people when they were shot and, uh, you know, wounded? Where did they get the treatment? Were they, I mean, a lot of people were afraid, so they didn't, whatever hospitals. Well, I'm were. sorry you don't speak for us, and you yeah. won't be joining us yeah. in the afternoon. Yeah. We will hear about yeah. that. We've got yeah. testimonies. Yeah. Um, uh, Fariba and her husband have got 110 people that they yeah. have verified their identity and they've worked with them and they've actually assisted um, yeah. with exactly that issue. Yeah. They couldn't access health care because of the fear of going to hospital mm. and being shot, yeah. having a bullet in yeah. them. Yeah. So, yeah. Finding alternative and, and if I may freedom. just add, I, I'm, I'm pleased that we have uh, we have activism in in Geneva now, you know. Yes. And we we're very yes. you know very grateful, and I think we need to have more of that information. Like really, you have to be very strong in uh, activism and and below activism. So so it it of course it's about Iran, but it all is about a a, a very delicate region. So, you know, Balochis are also in Pakistan. Uh, there are Baloch people living in many parts of the world. So you have to reach out specifically on the Baloch issue, you know, so that the world members of the Human Rights Council know specifically this issue. I mean, today I would be very surprised if many are fully familiar. You see, if you go to a reach out, let's say, to the United Kingdom mission, if you say, OK, there's a Baloch issue, they might not be so familiar because, you know, it takes time, you see, and it takes activism. So I think there is a real need, and and not just in Geneva, also in New York in the General Assembly, because you know whenever uh, you know the UN Special Rapporteurs are are presenting their reports, but also reach out to uh, the independent experts. So yes. um, there are my mandate is there, but there are many others. So for example, extrajudicial killings, the Special Rapporteur on minorities, on torture. So this should be, uh, you know, a dedicated mission. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And of course, there are many other mechanisms, such as the United Nations Secretary General, the Universal Periodic Reviews. There are treaty mechanisms. So it's all about telling the world what is happening in Balochistan, how Balochi people are suffering. So we need a better consolidated effort from yeah. the Baluch community yeah. itself and then yeah. the rest of us yeah. to um, facilitate yeah. it. And, and it's heard. not a criticism. It no, is no, just no, a suggestion no, course, if, you, if, you, if you take it Well, it's important that, to hear it from mm. our experts as to what is needed, because then that will also guide the way forward. This afternoon, we will also hear about testimonies about environmental issues and education and the added discrimination against women and girls, mm. not just because of the laws, but because of the culture and the traditions and all of that. So. Yeah. Um, what we have promised other um, uh, UNSR experts is that during this coming week, we will translate everything and provide a report from the conference mm-hmm. to them. Yeah. And we'll also send Very you helpful. a copy so Very that you helpful. have it. So at least there's some documentation coming out of what we've heard today. I'm very mindful for time. Can yes, I very just, quickly because Payam has to go. Very okay. quickly. Just one minute. Um, and the question is for um, um, Mr. Rahman. Uh, during the first two years of your work as a UN Special Reporter yeah. for um, Iran, yeah. um, we didn't hear much about you or from you. I mm. guess it was mostly um, within the reports that you had in just uh, about yeah. Iran, yeah. etc. But during the last two years, you had more media appearances. Yeah. What changed your mind? And I'm asking mm. this because Possibly your mission is going to end very soon. I don't know whether you're going to renew it or not, but how we can approach the next UN 
reporter on Iran in yeah. order to get right from the beginning in the in the social media in media yeah. and being represented within our yeah community. I mean it's a, it's a very important question and it will take a very long time but briefly you see what when we uh, I mean I started in in July 2018 and you know there was an unfortunate passing of uh, uh, late Asma Jahangir yes. Uh, I took the mandate and clearly the terms of the mandate we have to follow in terms of trying to orient ourselves as to what we can do to better promote and protect the rights of uh, of the people of Iran. So one of my uh, first uh, and still a uh, very uh, s- uh, strong ambitions is to be allowed access to the country, you know. And I was I uh, have been engaging with the Iranian authorities to actually give me that access and and that that consumed quite a lot of time. it there was a dialogue going on we 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 were trying and we still try to have access but you have to remember that um during my mandate so the first two years you mentioned uh in 2020 we we have the pandemic uh, immediately concerning so a lot of interruptions did take place and we were juggling with with a lot of issues so 2018 i took over we had this um, november 29 protests it was it was devastating then trying to deal with the consequences of the pandemic you know complete shutdown and over a period of time it has come to pass that the situation has become so so wor- worsened that media campaigns are needed and that's where i thought that okay now i need to uh, you know go further than what my mandate says and and i can assure you that the mandate is very sensitive we have to protect the mandate you see and that has been at the forefront of my mind that if i am too aggressive and perhaps you are suggesting that that could jeopardize the actual you weren't mandate. aggressive during the last two years you were just uh, more apparent yeah but the, that that's your view but that that is not the view perhaps of all of the st- stakeholders because they want a certain direction for this mandate you you have to look at where where yeah, the mandate want. is So I'm very happy to explain but I think it's it's also a diplomatic channel that we have to adopt and we have to be very careful in in taking steps forward. Thank you very much everyone for your time. I'm very grateful to my wonderful panel. Thank you for giving us your time at this very important day. Bon voyage to Oslo. Take with you our love and support for Nagis Mohammadi and her beautiful children who will be receiving the honor on her behalf. Thank you everyone. We're going to have a break for an hour and we'll be back here for 2 p.m. hopefully with no more technical issues. There's light lunch outside. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.